Perimeter and area in the coordinate plane were at 10.4. That means we have nine previous videos for Chapter 10 that are linked in the description if you need them. In Lesson 10.3a, we estimated the area of an irregular shape by drawing a composite figure that approximated the irregular shape, dividing it into simpler shapes, then using the appropriate area formula for each simpler shape. Another method of estimating area is to use a grid and count the squares on the grid. We can estimate the area of this irregular shape with two different methods. One way we can draw a composite figure that approximates the shape. We'll cut off the curves and just make trapezoids and rectangles and stuff. And another way is we can count the number of squares inside the figure. So for our first method, we draw simpler shapes that approximate the irregular shape then find the area of the composite figure. So you can see there was a curve here, but I went straight down. And there's a curve here, and I went straight across to make a triangle. We can add up all the areas of all the smaller parts, and we get 36 units squared. The second method of doing it is we count the numbers of squares that are actually inside the figure, estimating half squares. We can use a little square for the whole square and a triangle for a half square. There's about 31 of these full squares inside, and there's about 13 little triangles. So the area is 31 full squares plus 13 half triangles. So we're going to do half times 13, which is 6.5. We add this together and get 37.5 units squared. Well, the other way we did it, we got 36 units squared. So maybe this one's a little more accurate. We can find perimeter and area in the coordinate plane. It tells us to draw and classify the polygon with these vertices A, B, C, and D. And we need to find the perimeter and area of the polygon. So the first thing we do is we draw the polygon. We plot these points. We connect the vertices to make this polygon. And A, B, C, D appears to be a rectangle. We verify that it's a rectangle by using slopes to show that the sides are perpendicular. If it does come out to be a rectangle, we know which formula to use. So, to show that the sides are perpendicular, we're going to use the slope formula and our ordered pairs. And the slope of AB is 4 minus 1 over 2 minus a negative 4 using our x and y values. And we get that the slope of segment AB is a half. The slope of segment BC is negative 2. The slope of CD, which you can also say is DC if you want to read it from left to right, but the book has it this way, would be a half. And the slope of DA, or AD if you read it left to right, but the book has it as DA, would be a negative 2. The consecutive sides are perpendicular, so ABCD is a rectangle. So now we know what formula to use to find the area. We also need to find the perimeter. We're going to use the distance formula to assign B and H in our, in our area formula for a rectangle and for our perimeter. CD will be B and BC will be H in A equals BH and in the perimeter formula. So using the distance formula, we use the points for CD and we find that the distance between C and D is 3 square root of 5. And for H, for our height, BC, the distance between these, is 2 square root of 5. So now, for the perimeter formula, P equals 2B plus 2H, we can put in 2 times 3 square root of 5 plus 2 times 2 square root of 5, which gives us 10 square root of 5 units for our perimeter. For our area, A equals BH, we have our b, we have our h, so we've got 3 square root of 5 times 2 square root of 5, which on our calculators gives us 30 units squared. So we had to prove that it was a rectangle first. We used slope formula, we used distance formula, and we found our perimeter and area. For a figure in a coordinate plane that doesn't have an area formula, 
it may be easier to enclose the figure in a rectangle and subtract the areas of the parts of the rectangle that aren't included in the figure. We need to find the area of the polygon with vertices W, X, Y, Z. We plot these points, connect the vertices, and it's not quite, you know, these are not parallel. So we have a quadrilateral but there's not really a formula we can use for this. So we draw the polygon and enclose it in a rectangle. I put it in this green rectangle. We find the area of the rectangle, area equals base times height. We've got eight units going across for the base and we've got seven going up. Eight times seven is 56 units squared. So now we know the area for the entire rectangle. We can find the area for triangles A, B, C, and D and subtract that from the rectangle and that should give us what's left over as our pink figure. We can actually look on the diagram and count how many squares are going across and up, going across and down. We can find the area with the triangle area formula, half base height, and A is going across five and going up and down four. So we have half times five times four, which gives us 10 units squared. B is going across three and going down two, so we do half times three times two, which gives us three units squared. We do the same thing for C and D, and we find out they're five units squared and nine units squared. So now we know all the areas for the triangles. Now all we have to do is subtract the areas of the triangles from the area of the rectangle. The rectangle was 56 units squared, we take off each of the triangles and we come up with 29 units squared. If you find it easier, you can total the area of the triangles as a 27 and then subtract their sum from the 56 units of the rectangle. Whichever way you find easier, you're still going to get 29 units squared. So we found the area of this pink figure by making a rectangle around it, finding the area of the rectangle, then, finding the area of each of the triangles, subtracting that from the rectangle, and we know whatever's left over must be the area of the pink figure. Okay? Now, this is a little bit famous. It's the missing square puzzle. If you look at this diagram, it's got this red figure, this blue one, this green one, this yellow one, but this one also has the red one that's going the same units across and up, it also has the blue ones going the same units across and up, and the green and the yellow one are covering the same amount of units. But the bottom one has a missing square. So in the puzzle, the two figures are made up of the same pieces, but one figure appears to have a larger area because it's got an extra square. We can use coordinates to show the area does not change when the pieces are rearranged. Why does the bottom figure appear to have a larger area by one empty space? To solve this, we need the area of the top figure's shapes. We need the area of each one of these shapes. The red one is going five units across and two units up. So half times base times height, we get five units squared. For the blue one, it's going across three and up one. That's 1.5 units squared. The green one, we can just see it's one, two, three squares. It's three units squared. The yellow one is two units squared. We total them up and we get 11.5 units squared. But when we count the units for the bottom, try, for the bottom figure, we get five units squared for the red one, just like we did up here. We get 1.5 units squared for the blue one, just like we did here three units squared for the green one and two units squared for the yellow one. They have the exact same number of units squared. So how could that one extra square be there, that white one? They have the same amount of units squared, so let's check the slope of the triangles. The red one goes across five and up two, so the rise is two and the run is five, its slope is two-fifths. For the blue one, it went across three units and up one. So its rise is one and its run is three. Its slope is one third. And because the two triangles have different slopes, they don't actually make a straight line. This means the overall shape of all the colors isn't really a triangle. When the red one was on top and the blue one was down here, it was actually a little convex because the slopes were different. And when the blue one was on top and the red one was down here, 
they were actually a little concave because the slopes were different. It was just hard to see because it was so small. If we dilate this top figure by a scale factor of two or more, we can see the slopes are different. You can kind of see it's a little concave here. You can see the slope is not quite a straight line. And if we do it by a scale factor of three, it really st starts to become more evident. We can see how it's going in a little bit here. It's a little concave. The more we enlarge it, the difference of their slopes becomes more obvious. I'm going to have a link in the description for an animation of these moving around. Check that out. It's a very quick link to a Wikipedia article, okay, with uh, animation. Now that you know that their slopes are different, we can look at this and see it looks a little concave here, and this one looks a little convex here. So now you know the answer to the missing square puzzle. They have different slopes. It's not really a triangle. Our next lesson is going to be 10.5, and we're going to talk about the effects of changing dimensions proportionally before we move on to the three parts of 10.6. The first part is about probability, then we're going to talk geometric probability, then we're going to use geometric probability to estimate pi. So now you know the two methods to estimate area, right here. You also know that you can use a slope formula and distance formula to help find the perimeter and area in a coordinate plane. You also know from here that we can draw a rectangle around a figure to find its area. You also know the missing square puzzle answer, don't you? The slopes were different. They weren't, they weren't really triangles. It's an optical illusion. I hope you're having a great day, and I'll see you next time. Bye.